Photosynthesis in lakes is going to be determined in part by light, but there are other limits to pelagic photosynthesis that need to be considered when trying to calculate how much photosynthesis is likely to occur within a lake. For plants on land, CO2 can be limiting. We talked about that with light response curves. When light levels are high enough, CO2 often becomes a limiting factor. In lakes, carbon dioxide is actually not very limiting. In part, many lakes are fed by groundwater, and groundwater tends to have relatively high carbon dioxide concentrations. In fact, lakes are often a net source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The CO2 levels tend to be high, higher than the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide rarely gets drawn down to low levels. In part, <clears throat> CO2 doesn't become limiting because there's additional sources or storage of carbon dioxide within water. So this equation here, equation 5.2, shows that if you take water and CO2, you can form carbonic acid. This acid and bicarbonate are often formed and it's pH dependent, and this bicarbonate can serve as a further source of CO2 once carbon dioxide and gaseous form gets removed by plants. So you have a lot of buffering within lakes due to bicarbonate and carbonate being stored within the lake also. In addition, there's a lot of recycling that happens of carbon dioxide. So even after it's initially drawn down, it gets regenerated relatively quickly. If, if CO2 is not necessarily a limiting factor, what else besides light could be limiting? Water is unlikely to be limiting. There's more than enough of that around, which really just leaves nutrients. And nutrients limit pho phytoplankton photosynthesis primarily through their effects on the production of new cells. If you add nutrients to lake, often you get big responses in phytoplankton biomass, and there's a lot more photosynthesis that occurs. Essentially, when what the authors were saying is that when fertilized with nutrients, you get more cells, not a greater capacity to produce, to photosynthesize. So you'll get a big response in biomass, and the capacity of each individual cell doesn't necessarily change. So in addition to light levels determining photosynthesis, we also need to think strongly about nutrients within lakes. Most of these patterns that you see here of photosynthet of at least phytoplankton, not much phytoplankton, not much there, not much there, a lot right here, are not being driven by differences in light availability. CO2 concentrations are going to be just as high in Lake Michigan as they are Lake Erie. The difference really is nutrient input, and this is not atypical for lakes, whether we're talking about the Great Lakes, relatively large bodies of water, or smaller bodies of water that we can barely see in this satellite photo. The reason in Lake Erie, for example, that you're going to see such large amounts of phytoplankton biomass, why it's going to look really green, has to do with the Maumee River. And that drains a large agricultural area here, where you can get large inputs of phosphorus. So just for reference, here's Cleveland again, Toledo somewhere over here, we've got the Bass Islands and Pelee Island here, and this right here is corn country. So we're going to have a lot of phosphorus that gets put down. Now before, in the 70s, we used to have in Lake Erie a lot of phytoplankton that would occur because of phosphorus inputs from households. And this is a case where there used to be phosphorus that was in detergents that would then get washed out into the lake and cause these phytoplankton blooms. Nowadays, it tends to be more phosphorus that's being put down from agricultural systems, a small portion of which gets washed off into Lake Erie that then generates these large phytoplankton blooms. So you can see there's large patterns in photosynthetic rates in lakes. There's going to be vertical patterns that we're not really able to see from above here, but spatially, not a lot of photosynthesis, a lot of photosynthesis. And that's really been driven by nutrients. Now the authors also cover streams and shorelines and some of the limits to photosynthesis that we have in streams. It's important to read this section, but if you take a look at the processes, there's not much unique about the processes that are occurring in streams, for example, as opposed to what we just learned about lakes, pelagic systems. And so in that case, read it. It'll reinforce what you understand about how photosynthesis occurs within lakes. And tell you a little bit more about how they occur in streams, but the same basic processes that we learned about for lakes are going to apply for streams also.